In many ways, Darwin's ideas were completely revolutionary at, at the time of the publication of The Origin of Species. But in many other ways, he really built on the ideas of people who came before him and ideas that were sort of in the wind at, during his time. And there were vast differences between the ways his ideas were received by the public in general and how they were received within the scientific community. So the purpose of this web lecture is to give you some historical perspective about the ideas that led up to Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and the ways in which it has been modified since his work. So the learning objectives for this lesson are first, to describe how people thought about questions of diversity prior to Darwin. Secondly, to think about this idea of special creation differs from the ideas that Darwin discussed and how questioning the assumptions underlying this idea of special creation paved the way for evolutionary thinking. Third, to distinguish the ways in which Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was and was not revolutionary among scientists as compared to the general public, and to talk a little bit about the major gap in Darwin's theory, why it was such a stumbling block to its acceptance during Darwin's time, and then understand how the modern field of genetics closed that gap and really completed Darwin's theory of evolution. This idea of dealing with diversity really goes back as far as human communication, the need to be able to discuss different kinds of plants and animals, to know what's dangerous, what's safe, what's good to eat, what's not. So the naming and classification of organisms, do we want to eat the beautiful cherry flavored mushrooms that look like they have candy buttons on them, or do we want to eat the drab, brown, unappetizing looking mushrooms? It's important to be able to communicate that kind of information. So humans developed a naming system to be able to communicate information about different, different organisms uh, in the world. But the first time that this kind of classification and naming system was really formalized was by a botanist named Carolus Linnaeus in the 18th century. And he was really the father of taxonomy. He was the one who originally developed this hierarchical classification system that we still use quite a bit today. So taxonomy is the science of describing, naming, and classifying species of living or fossil organisms. And of course, we have this system of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species that are based on overall similarities between organisms. Species that had a great deal of similarity, were grouped together in two genera, and so on and so on, based on whatever similar features he could recognize and describe. At the time that Linnaeus was doing this, the prevailing idea about how all of these species came to be was this idea of special creation. And Linnaeus believed in special creation, and he believed that this organizational system reflected the divine plan of creation, that the creator grouped these organisms when he created them in a way similar to the way Linnaeus later grouped them, and that his study of the diversity of life and his study of taxonomy was actually a study of one component of the mind of the creator. And there was also this idea that species were created in the relatively recent past. This Archbishop Usher that you heard about on the first day of class was actually a real person that really did calculate the age of the earth based on the ages of the prophets and computed that it was about 6,000 years old. Up until this time, when we thought about diversity, we we're thinking mostly about the pattern of diversity. So... Around the 18th century, we started to discover the fossil record, and we started to see the remains of animals that were quite different from the organisms that we see today. And so this led some thinkers to start to question this idea that species, organisms, do not change over time, that maybe these fossil species that were being discovered that were not identical to any species that are alive now 
might have been the precursors to species that are alive. And so several thinkers started proposing this idea of gradual change through time. One was a French anatomist, Comte de Buffon, who wrote a great deal about what we call the transmutation of species, the gradual change through time of species to account for the fossil record. Another one in England was actually the grandfather of Charles Darwin, Erasmus Darwin, who dabbled in natural history. He was a poet, a prolific writer, and he wrote a great deal about the possibility that that species might change through time. So these thinkers early on in the 18th century began to describe this pattern of evolution and that this gradual change through time might help to explain the diversity of living species that we see and certainly would explain the fossil diversity. Archbishop Usher, his thinking was very, very influential throughout Europe during the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. And so it was fairly commonly accepted that the Earth was only about 6,000 years old. So these observations and these ideas that species could change gradually through time were a little bit hard for most people to accept because there simply was not enough time available for very small changes to create these large changes that would be needed to explain the diversity of living organisms. So it kind of makes sense if you believe that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, that this idea of species gradually changing through time would be absolutely outrageous because there simply was not enough time available. These ideas began to be uprooted around the early 19th century when farmers and surveyors and others who made a habit of digging around in the ground started discovering layers in the earth. Layers that appeared to represent sort of an orderly deposit of um, different layers, different strata of the earth in a very regular way such that the oldest layers you found deeper in the earth and the newer layers were found closer to the surface. And this idea that the earth itself was the result of these processes that laid down these layers of the earth was formalized by actually a contemporary of Charles Darwin. His name was Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell was the foremost geologist of his day, very, very highly respected. So he was a friend and colleague to Darwin, and he calculated, based on the strata that he found and the processes that created those strata, the sedimentation of different layers, based on the geological structures found in England that he was studying, he calculated that the Earth must be older than 300 million years, an unimaginable amount of time for a society that did not think that the world was any older than 6,000 years. And he proposed this idea, which was revolutionary at the time, that the geological features that we see in the world today were formed by the exact same processes that we can observe, things like sedimentation, erosion, these very, very slow, gradual processes that in your lifetime would not make a difference of more than a couple of millimeters, but over millions and millions and millions of years, they can form mountains, valleys, gulches, all of the geological features that we see right now. And this idea is known as uniformitarianism. What uniformitarianism means is that we can explain the features that we see in the world based on processes that we can observe in our own time, working over vast, vast, vast uh, stretches of time to have a large effect. This is in contrast with the previous idea known as catastrophism, which believed that the geological structures that we see were the result of catastrophic events on a scale that we have never experienced in our lifetimes. Devastating floods humongous earthquakes, volcanic eruptions on a scale that could create these large-scale features in a single event rather than very 
minute, small processes building up over large periods of time. So this is the idea of uniformitarianism. Nothing that we see on Earth requires any more explanation than the processes that we ourselves observe commonly. So uniformitarians, such as Hutton and Lyell, they estimated the ages of the rock formations that they found there in England based on the known rates of sedimentation, erosion, etc. And they back calculated this and extrapolated the age of the Earth to be at least 300 million years old. But that was based just on the formations that they found in England. Darwin recognized that these formations in England that were at least 300 million years old were relatively recent compared to some of the formations that are seen elsewhere in the world. And he estimated that the Earth must be billions of years old, which due to techniques like radiometric dating that we have now actually ends up being the true age of the Earth, about four and a half billion years old. So that really helps to refute one of these main criticisms of evolution, of transmutation, of this gradual change of species through time, that there simply was not enough time available. Now there are billions and billions of years for these changes to happen. It's a lot more likely that the diversity that we see in the world can be explained based on these small, minute changes over time when there's that much time for this to work. Another problem for special creation is this idea of extinction. If there was a single creation event that created all the species in the world just exactly as we know them now, well, first of all, if species went extinct, eventually we'd run out of species if there were no new acts of creation to generate more species. But it also created doubt in people's minds about the creator's plans. Why would a creator create species only for them just to go extinct. So one of the greatest, um, earliest documenters of these extinct species was a Frenchman known as Georges Cuvier, also known as the Pope of Bones. He was one of the first paleontologists, one of the earliest functional morphologists. So uh, Cuvier was one of the earliest scientists to study this relationship between form and function, the idea that you can infer something about what an organism did with its various body parts based on how those body parts were shaped and formed. And Cuvier documented many, many extinctions. So he found, he analyzed remains of things like mastodons, Irish elk, things that resembled species alive today, but were clearly not represented by any living species. So he documented many of these extinctions, but he still did not think that species evolved. He did not believe in this transmutation of species. So he believed that extinctions were the result of periodic catastrophes, followed by subsequent acts of creation. So the reason we don't find modern species in the fossil record oftentimes is Perhaps they were the result of another creation, and then we don't have this problem of running out of species as things went extinct. So he was definitely in this catastrophism camp. He did not believe in gradual change through time. In fact, because he believed so strongly in this very, very close connection between form and function, he really believed that every organism was so ideally suited to whatever functions it performed, that any slight change in any aspect of the morphology of that animal would result in a complete destruction of the function of that part. So he actually believed that gradual change through time was impossible just because the animal could not possibly perform as well with any altered version of uh, the structure that it has. So up to this point, all of these thinkers that we thought about were basically contemplating the pattern. What are the patterns that we see in evolution? What are the patterns in the fossil record? What are the patterns in living diversity that we see? The earliest biologist that we know of that was actually really trying to think about the process by which organisms might change over time is a man known as Jean-Baptiste Pierre-Antoine de Monet Chevalier de Lamarck. 
better known to most of us as just Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And so Lamarck believed in transmutation, and he had developed a model for how these changes might happen. So Lamarck made the observation that organisms can sometimes be shaped by their environment. A blacksmith who is constantly exercising his arm by wielding a heavy hammer ends up with large muscles in his arm, things of that nature. And so if this is true, then animals can make changes during their own lifetime in their anatomy, in their physiology, in any feature of their biology through the use or disuse of that structure. Lamarck further argued that these changes that were acquired during the organism's lifetime could be inherited by their offspring. And this idea is known as the inheritance of acquired characters. The most common example of this is this image of earlier giraffes on the left here. Uh, they've got short necks and they're stretching and reaching to try to get these higher leaves off the trees. And through that effort of stretching their necks during their lifetime, their necks became just a little, little bit longer through that exertion. And those slightly longer necks would have been passed on to their offspring, who would have also been stretching and reaching and trying to get those higher leaves. Their necks would get a little bit longer. The next generation's necks would get a little bit longer until eventually you get these giraffes with very long necks over long periods of time. And in that way, organisms are sort of molded to their environment. We now know that in most cases, characteristics that are acquired during an organism's lifetime are not passed on to their offspring. With our current knowledge of genetics, we know that only heritable traits, only traits that are encoded in genes, are passed down. To recap the historical figures we've seen so far, so we saw Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy, George Cuvier. Both of these thinkers made essential contributions that led to this idea of evolution. Linnaeus, by grouping organisms together based on similarity, really foreshadowed this idea of descent with modification that we'll be talking about a great deal as we talk about evolution by natural selection. And then, of course, Cuvier, by documenting these extinctions and, and studying the similarities between these fossil species and living species, this really helped to give rise to this idea of continuity through time of species evolving into other species. But neither of these two individuals believed that species were transmutable. Then in the 18th century, early 19th century, we see Comte de Buffon and Erasmus Darwin both writing a great deal about this idea that species could change through time and that that might be a way of explaining species diversity. Both of these were really describing and discussing the pattern of evolution, the fact that organisms can change through time, that previous species can give rise to later species. But neither of these really proposed any sort of mechanism to explain this pattern. Finally, we see Lamarck and Lyell. Lamarck explicitly proposing a mechanism that could explain the change in organisms over time to explain this evolutionary pattern. Lyell less directly, but by proposing this idea of uniformitarianism that the processes that went on historically were no different from the processes we see today working over very large periods of time it was a hugely influential idea to Darwin. It really got Darwin thinking about the changes that we could see in artificial selection, breeding animals, farming plants to create versions of the species that suit our needs better. He was able to use this idea that Lyle had to extrapolate those kinds of changes over vast periods of time to imagine really large changes in species given enough time. So now let's think about the reception that this idea of natural selection received in Darwin's time. So let's first think about the reaction of the public at large. Of course, the popular debate surrounded the religious implications of this theory. The idea at the time was that if God was not necessary to explain the diversity of species, 
then this whole idea was going to undermine the concept of God at all and cause people to doubt the existence of God, which of course, for the society at that time, religion was the source of all moral behavior, of all ethics, and they envisioned the complete destruction of civil society as we know it as a result of these ideas. This kind of fear could be best summed up by a uh, probably apocryphal quote. And with respect to evolution, their attitude was much like the point of view of the wife of an English canon who greeted the announcement of man's alleged descent from monkeys with the remark, my dear, I trust that it is not true. But if it is, let us pray that it will not become generally known. So the fear was that if people found out that humans were no different from any other kind of animal, that humans would suddenly become animals and would lose this sort of special status as sophisticated, moral human beings. And these ideas generated a lot of popular public debates that were held, philosophical societies that were frequented by the general public. And one very famous debate was between the Bishop of Oxford, uh, Samuel Wilberforce, and Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a great champion of Darwin's ideas. In fact, Darwin was made so uncomfortable by the emotional reaction to the theory of evolution that he really withdrew from any kind of public debate whatsoever. And really, it was the younger scientists that were the ones out there debating and championing his ideas. And so Thomas Henry Huxley came to be known as Darwin's bulldog and really promoting these ideas. And so in this particular debate between Samuel Wilberforce and Thomas Henry Huxley, Wilberforce was uh, famously quoted as asking Thomas Henry Huxley, is it through your grandfather or your grandmother that you claim your descent from a monkey? And being the... uh, irrepressible wit that Thomas Henry Huxley was, he came back with this zinger. I would not be ashamed to have a monkey for my ancestor, but I would be ashamed to be connected with a man who used his great gifts to obscure the truth. Obviously not a quipster, but he was the great champion of Darwin's ideas and helped to promote them amongst the public in general without a great deal of success at the time. But if we think about scientific circles... Lyle was an extremely well-respected geologist. This idea of the age of the Earth among scientists being much, much, much longer than 6,000 years was very well accepted by the time Darwin published. And so most scientists didn't have this idea that there wasn't enough time for gradual evolution to have happened. They knew that the world was at least, at least 300 million years old. So this idea of change over time was widely accepted. It was the most plausible explanation for what they were seeing in this rapidly growing fossil record as more and more fossils were being found. It was a plausible explanation for patterns of diversity. But what wasn't widely accepted at the time among the scientific community was this mechanism of natural selection. This is what was controversial among scientists in Darwin's time. And the reason for this was that at the time, the mode of inheritance was unknown. Nobody knew why offspring had this tendency to resemble their parents. And the most common understanding of how this happened was some form of blending inheritance, that the traits in an offspring were an average of the traits of the parents. And this makes sense in terms of a lot of traits that we know now are the result of a combination of many different genes plus the effect of the environment, things such as height, which the offspring often do sort of seem like some kind of average of the traits of the parents. So why was this such a big problem for the acceptance of natural selection as the mechanism for evolution? Why was this a problem? Let's do a thought experiment to explain this. Imagine a brand new trait in a population that was beneficial. Brand new mutation, we now would call it a mutation, just say it's, it's a novel trait that came up, we don't know how at the time. But there's only one individual in the whole population that has it. Okay, it's brand new. The individual with that trait 
If it was beneficial in terms of natural selection, that would mean that that individual would have more offspring than the average. But according to this idea of blending inheritance, each offspring would only have half the value of that trait due to this averaging, this blending with the other parent. Then in the next generation, each grandchild would have one-fourth of that trait. And eventually, going down through the generations, it would be diluted in strength. The benefit would decrease and decrease and decrease until the trait was gone. It would just effectively be diluted out of the population because of the mixing with the original version of the trait that was less beneficial that was possessed by the rest of the population. So think of it as a single drop of paint dropped into a bucket and then stirred up that original drop would be gone. You would not even be able to detect it <clears throat> once it was mixed into the bucket. So this was the problem. Early in the 20th century, it was discovered that an Augustinian friar working in what is now part of the Czech Republic was solving this problem at that very time, completely unbeknownst to Darwin or any of the people who were debating this issue. And Gregor Mendel, as you know uh, from your genetics class, made major contributions to the understanding of inheritance. And so we now know that contrary to this idea of blending inheritance, that these units, these genes, are passed on intact by each parent. Each gamete, according to the law of segregation, receives one of two alleles for each gene, and each parent contributes one randomly selected one to the offspring. So what that means is that trait could disappear in the in the first generation, but could come back again full strength in the next generation. It is not lost or diluted or diminished in any way. It is passed on intact with its full effect in subsequent generations. And then the other major conclusion of his work was this law of independent assortment that each trait is inherited independently from others. So we now know that this is only strictly true if genes are on separate chromosomes, much, much more about that as we go on through the semester. But so now we have this more complete picture of the inheritance, and we see that this big gap in Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, which he fully recognized, this was an agonizing flaw in his own mind that haunted him to his dying day. Um, that he just could not explain in terms of his theory of natural selection. After his death, we rediscovered this work in the early 20th century. So biologists in the early 20th century quickly realized that this was the one missing piece that kept Darwin's theory from being a complete slam dunk and... The debate was largely settled at this point. The newly developing field of population genetics allowed researchers to actually measure these changes in allele frequency under selection. And this idea of change over time due to selection is basically now an observable fact. And we call this marriage in the 20th century between Darwinian natural selection and Mendelian genetics. We call this the modern synthesis. This is what really completed Darwin's theory. And the major conclusions of the modern synthesis are, number one, that gradual evolution results from small genetic changes that are acted upon by natural selection. The origin of species and higher taxa, or macroevolution, can be explained in terms of natural selection acting on individuals or microevolution. So microevolution working over large periods of time to change allele frequencies are ultimately responsible for the origin of higher taxa or this pattern of diversity that we see in the world today.